So today's topic is very difficult, and this is actually the fourth time that I'm recording this video. Uh, and I'm not going back outside to do it again, so let's see how it goes this time. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about whether or not community co-benefits have actually harmed carbon projects. And this is coming from my personal observation. What I've observed over the years is that essentially what we've done is link climate benefits with community cone benefits so that many of these carbon projects are required to support their communities uh, in a very intense way. And so many of these forest carbon projects you'll see from Vera are, you know, building schools with the money, they're building water treatment plants, they're supporting communities of upwards of 10,000 people. Uh, and the problem that that's created by linking these two outcomes is that if the carbon project fails to meet its climate objectives, it becomes a humanitarian disaster to, to deprive the community of that money. And so the situation that we have is that very good people who care a lot about the communities are essentially cheating forest carbon projects, brushing deforestation under the rug, or basically rigging carbon projects to get more credits, because, because it allows the communities to continue to receive funding. And so we've got a situation where it's just, if carbon projects are allowed to fail, it creates a humanitarian disaster. And that's an impossible conflict of interest in which the carbon benefits of these projects always end up on the losing side. Um, real quickly, I think I should give a background of how we got to this situation. Um, the initial carbon protocols began in the late 90s uh, after the uh, Kyoto Protocol with the clean development mechanism. And people really didn't know what they were doing back then. So they basically went out there and just said, if you grow trees, you get credits. There wasn't any thought to it. To it. This resulted in many projects having really terrible community benefits. In fact, there were instances of avoided deforestation projects where the people who actually lived inside the projects didn't even know that it was taking place. There were place instances of reforestation projects being sponsored by multinational timber conglomerates that were, you know, just snapping up land in a predatory way and planting trees. So 10, 10 or so years later, Vera came along and they said, we're going to make sure that these projects tie in well with the community. And ever since then, they've been increasing the amount of co-benefits that are associated with these projects. And so, you know, one, they even have a little stamp, their CCB stamp that says, okay, this project is doing what good for the community. But more and more what's happened, and partially because consumers have demanded it, is what we're seeing is projects that are where their funds go 100% towards the community, and, and they've essentially been converted into, you know, projects that are designed to fight poverty in the region. And again, the problem with that is that if the community co-benefits and the climate benefits are so intertangled, it, it gives people a justification to cheat. And so I have seen community projects with just the most altruistic and amazing co-benefits have little to no carbon or climate benefits whatsoever. I've seen instances of, you know, Native American Alaskan communities drawing boundaries around only the trees that they couldn't harvest on remote islands. I've seen instances of you know, Vera avoided deforestation projects being completely deforested or being partially deforested, failing to prevent deforestation. Uh, but if they were to actually honestly report how much deforestation took place in their project, the community would stop receiving money and it would be a humanitarian disaster. I've seen Vera avoided deforestation projects rig their baselines to receive six to eight times the amount of credits that they probably should for preserving that land. Again, with the justification that this money goes to supporting the communities. And, you know, I'm, I'm a climate scientist, so I don't actually know how the community co-benefits are doing, but I think in a lot of these cases, it's working, right? A lot of the times the communities are benefiting a lot from these projects. But we've made it impossible to be objective about the climate outcomes. And that's the whole point of this process, isn't it? This is not, this is not a forum for reducing poverty. This is a forum for offsetting climate emissions. And what's more, you know, many of the people who are purchasing carbon credits are increasingly making demands that projects have these benefits. And it strikes me as being extremely hypocritical of them to do so. Because these companies, 
they're the ones who are putting pollution into the atmosphere in the first place. They've committed a crime against the climate. They've committed a, cl a crime against all of us. And so they have to atone for that by buying offsets. And it just strikes me as being ab absurd that they're able to dictate terms about how these projects spend their money. And it's something that you only see in the forest carbon industry, right? You don't see this in other climate offsetting. You don't see this in other carbon offsetting schemes. Imagine if the contractor who installed methane capture devices on landfills had to spend that money on the community. Imagine if the, the people building giant factories in the middle of the desert to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere had to reinvest that money 100% in the community. So it just, the whole idea just strikes me as being hypocritical. And don't get me wrong, I think many of the companies who are buying these credits should probably be supporting, you know, fighting poverty. Many of these companies have supply chains that are deeply tied to developing nations and in some way are exploitative of communities like this. But this is not the place to do it. Because what we've done is we've created a system where it's just impossible for these projects to fail. It's created, it's put me personally in a very awkward position as an objective scientist, right? Because I have many times throughout my career had to make tough calls where, where I have to be honest and oftentimes brutal about the climate benefits that maybe aren't taking place on these projects. And it sometimes means even talking in person to the communities who may not even be aware of the situation that exists. You know, it's made it really difficult to be objective about these projects, but it's also, it's made it difficult just to, you know, have a conversation about these projects, right? Because if you're, if you're criticizing these projects, then you're criticizing the work that they're doing to the communities. And, and it's, you know, it's made it so that, you know, I've known people who have tried to go out there and say, you know, kind of like, uh, critical things about forest carbon projects, and they're just not able to do so because doing so means attacking some Alaskan indigenous Native American community. Um, as a climate scientist, we have to be objective about the climate offsets. Our number one job with carbon credits is to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. That is the one, that is the only job. And, and I do want to make clear, Forest carbon credits come with a lot of other co-benefits that aren't community co-benefits, right? So there's a myriad of ecological co-benefits that come with planting a forest. You know, you're improving soil carbon and sequestering a bunch of soil that way. You're creating wildlife habitat for, you know, countless endangered or threatened species. You're filtering water for the communities so that the water can be drinkable. Uh, these are all real tangible ecological benefits that do take place when you when you have a forest carbon project. And so, you know, I encourage you, if you're buying carbon credits, next time think about whether or not those community co-benefits are maybe worth the actual cost of the carbon. Because it's going to come back to us at some point. At some point, we're going to realize that we're not doing the offsetting that we say we're doing. Because the climate's just going to keep getting warmer. And... If you're working at one of these companies, at some point, someone like me is going to point out that this great community project that you sponsored might not actually have great carbon benefits after all. That isn't to say that all community projects don't have good carbon benefits. Certainly many of them do. But the fact is, uh, we have created this system where they're so interlocked that it can be tough to decide which ones are good.